It looked like the Uber emptied the uh, audience almost. So congrats on their launch here in the Nordics. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. Good to have you here, Ned. Um, Thank you. Let's, um, let's start off with a little bit of a background into your, your career, what you've done. So in a few sentences, in a minute, take a minute or two just to go briefly over what you've done. So we'll dive into sure. those topics later on. I think at, um, I, um, well, most interesting part is starting 2005, I was uh, a founding partner of a Chinese browser company called Maxton. Uh, it was launched uh, at the same time as Firefox, but uh, mainly in China and became number two browser in China. So for three years I was flying between Israel, Silicon Valley and China trying to grow this browser. Uh, Google invested in us and we spent a lot of time trying to grow the browser internationally. Uh, and that's how I came in, in, in contact with Facebook in 2007 uh, when we were actually the first browser that had developed a, a, a plugin uh, to the Facebook, uh, for Facebook and, and bundled it with a browser. And so Dustin Moskowitz and Mark Zuckerberg was very excited about this. Um, and um, I got an offer I couldn't refuse. I moved to California and I, I became a head of uh, international business development and the first kind of international hire. So international BD and, 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 and mobile business uh, for Facebook uh, in 2007. Uh, and uh, that was really, uh, the focus was really there um, to, to grow the company uh, internationally uh, and, and explore you know, the, the new different markets uh, around the globe. Very good, very good. Let's, um, let's dive into the um, topic through Facebook because we are talking about sort of strategies for companies to go global. Um, what was the situation in 2007 with Facebook? How, how international was the company back then? Yeah, so, so Facebook was around, I think we had around 40, 50 million, 50 million users when I joined, I think July 2007. Um, it, it was a company, definitely a hot company with a growth trajectory, but we were mainly used in English-speaking markets. Uh, so basically North America, Canada, uh, England, and small pockets a little bit here and, and there. Uh, but we didn't really have any growth internationally besides that, and, and the site was only available in English. Um, and what, what was really very innovative and one of the most impressive things that I had witnessed inside a company was really a new way of thinking of how you grow and you expand the site or uh, the company internationally uh, in a new and a different way. Uh, in, initially, so my, my role was, uh, you know, head of business development, and usually that means that you, you are kind of deal-making, trying to grow uh, uh, something. Uh, but the problem is we had no real business model at that time, um, and we had nothing to give our potential partners in, 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 in order to get distribution. So we figure out what, what can we do, how can we grow organically and virally. Uh, and so uh, a very smart team came up with the idea, let's make the site available for translation uh, uh, to anybody who wants to translate the site into different languages. So basically, we, we, the team developed an application uh, where all the strings on the site were available. These are the words that you can translate to your language. And we made it available, and we started out with Spanish. And um, in very short time, people translated the site into Spanish, uh, deciding what is the best way to say certain things on Facebook. So for instance, you know, um, particularly in Chinese, it was interesting because nobody had an idea what, you know, how do you say poking in Chinese? That concept didn't really exist. And there's nobody where we, you know, we, we couldn't come up with that. But obviously, uh, the Chinese user will better know what words to choose, what could be closest, and what's kind of spirit of Facebook. And so, uh, we made it available, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2008, the translation in Spanish, and then rolled out with French. I remember French was translated in, into French by 4,000 uh, volunteering French uh, people in 12 hours, uh, before, before very we fast. Go, before we go into that, um, how was the, what were the um, uh, sort of uh, first indications that, okay, like, I mean, it's pretty obvious when you think about it logically that, you know, you, know, you localize the service to the local sure. people, but what was the sort of indications of traction after you made the translations? How, how was it different from before? Yeah, I mean, I think people sometimes underestimate the power of language and the small, small variations in language, that, that how powerful it is. So people will be using uh, you know, a site maybe in English uh, around the world, and 
let's face it, Facebook wasn't that complicated. It's a couple of menus and the rest is content generated by users. But it's unbelievable what a power it is when you suddenly read it in your own uh, uh, native language. And it, the, the language gets closer to your heart, so to speak. It feels more like your site. So we saw immediately an, a, a, an enormous usage in every site that was translated. Not only that we had a growth with new users signing up in that language or that region, but also uh, the retention increased significantly. And that's probably the most uh, important growth term in general is just retention. Because it doesn't help that you sign up tons of users unless they come back to the site over and over again. Uh, so that is really, really important. And, and language translation to the different languages it definitely fueled the retention. But also, um, you know, just even say you could say Spanish is one, one language, but it's even bigger than that because in South America, you know, we had people in, in Argentina that have a different type of language, a different type of Spanish, and the people in Chile wanted to say things a bit differently, and they got their own version. And so people basically voted. This is the way you say, you know, a certain thing on Facebook, and they voted thumbs up. Uh, and thumbs down for what they didn't like. And the one that got most thumbs up, he won the translation for that particular word, and he became like the king of translation for that language. And so people felt very passionate about, you know, translated most parts of the site and so yeah. on. So we, we had a good chat um, backstage with regards to um, going abroad or sort of internationalizing in Europe. So could you go through the story of, of Germany and, and how you sort of went about that? What was the situation there? I mean, yep. Europe is a very different market to the US um, when you sort of compare it on that level. Europe is very fragmented. There are right. lots of small individual markets as opposed to one large market. So how, how was it for you guys back then? Yeah, so, so uh, it was no big secret that we, our biggest competitor at that time was a German site that had copied Facebook. Everything ex except the color that was red, they own basically 85% of the student markets. And I was traveling back and forth to Germany trying to you know, get distribution deals with big potential distributors, but nobody would talk to us because they say, we don't care about you, we have this big site, they own the market, you are no, nobody. And so we had to figure out other ways, and we spent a lot of time, so you have one thing, making the site available to German, but that's only one part of it. The other thing was really looking at the, you know, the SEO, search engine optimization, and site maps for Germany for those particular pages, making sure that, you know, at that time, you know, if you search on a person uh, on, Facebook, on Google in Germany, you, we didn't even show up on the first site or on the first uh, result page. Not, uh, and so we, you know, team went together and, and, and you know, really looked at how can we make sure that we surface person or people search and you come to the top on German sites. And the same thing was rolled out in the rest of the world. Uh, you know. uh, so, so search, ba basically, I would say search engine and search engine marketing thing was extremely important for Facebook uh, uh, to win the German market. And once the snowball got rolling and you got a certain effect, then it, it spread by itself. And eventually, our bigger competitor that looked like we were never going to overpower them disappeared and became totally irrelevant after a few years. Uh, and, and a lot of this was just basically, uh, you know, thanks to uh, an amazing little team, a growth team uh, that consisted of uh, some engineers, search engine uh, experts, marketing experts, uh, BD people. I was fortunate to be part of that team and seeing, you know, on, on first hand on, on how this started. Today, that is a very big, very big group at Facebook, headed by a former colleague of mine called Alex Schulz, which is an amazing guy. And, and uh, so, so that's, that's search engine optimization, making sure that your site map, maps are right. Um, and that can also be translated to today into uh, like the app stores, whether it's Google Play or, or the Apple Store. Uh, translate, you know, putting up your site and making it available in the Spanish store doesn't help if you don't have the right type of copy. Perhaps you have to have, uh, you know, put your app in a different category than you would do in another place. And, and really look at, you know, every country is unique in its sense and you have to be sensitive to that. Um, it's nothing that you just, you know, run by a remote control and, you know, make the language available and that's it. What about um, for the founders and entrepreneurs out here? Um, what are some of the things that maybe they should be looking at before um, taking their first steps uh, to go international? I mean, we had a discussion that Israel and Finland are very similar markets in the sense that they're both um, almost 
you know, there are many industries that don't exist inside those borders. You need a bigger marketplace and uh, going global from day one, basically. But when you have that mindset, what are some of the things, in your opinion, that the entrepreneur should have in place before they start taking those first steps? Yeah, so, so what, what we discussed was basically, you know, in small markets like Israel, where I come from, um, you don't have a domestic market that is worthwhile developing a product for exclusively. And in a way, Finland is kind of similar in the sense that if you start a company here, you probably want to think immediately from day one outside of the borders because there's only, you know, five, six million, seven million people here and not all of them are actually potential customers even. So, uh, same thing in Israel, typical Israeli entrepreneurs, the first thing they do is thinking global from day one, set up headquarters in, in the US, so it's a US company, uh, and, and that makes it also easier for, for, for finding investors internationally, typical US investors that will rather invest in a US company uh, than, than, than a domestic Israeli company, and that's something that I recommend in general to do, because it's just easier to, to raise money that way, uh, to, to kind of remove that obstacle. But um, it's really thinking global from day one. It's thinking about where is your big market. It might be different from depending on what product you have. Obviously, number, the number one thing is, you know, if you don't have a great product, it doesn't matter what you do. It's only so far you can push it. Um, you have to have a great product market fit, of course. Uh, but if you have those basics there, then the question is, okay, is our big market the US, North America? Is it perhaps Asia? A lot of companies lately uh, are looking more towards Asia than immediately maybe launching in the US. So, and obviously, it's not like many times in, in, in the US, you know, people think that, hey, Europe is one market, that's like one country. You launch in Europe, that's it, you cover it. It's, it's, everybody here knows that's not the case. And Asia is the same thing, that's not one market. Every market is very unique, very different. Uh, and, and so basically, if you are launching a company here out of, let's say, um, you know, a small market, you should think about is the, you know, it's the same effort at the end of the day to grow a company. So you might as well go after the big addressable market from day one and then figure out what are the next markets uh, uh, where you know there's a potential big user base, uh, where uh, you know people buy, let's say, online a lot, whatever the parameters are for the business, and and then just go after market after market and focus on those big markets. Uh, it's not always easy uh, to know where you should start. And I I remember at Facebook we had a lot of discussions. You know, what should we go after? Should we try to go after to own some of the, the European markets first? Should we try to go after, you know, uh, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, and obviously China is like the big elephant in the room. Everybody wants to go for China and nobody succeeds. And that was also one of my uh, uh, responsibilities and, and that, that's, a, that's a whole chapter in itself. How do, you, how, do you, how do you make the decision of, uh, you know, prioritizing markets? Um, is it simply the size of the market, um, ease of entry, or maybe just briefly go through that, like what are the, maybe the drivers or decision right. issues that the entrepreneur should be thinking about? Yeah, so, so what we did was basically, we set up a matrix where we looked at obviously, you know, what is the biggest online population in the world? Uh, what's the, you know, even uh, like the, the BNP, biggest BNP in the market, which market is most developed for online uh, uh, services or advertising market online, which was our business model. Remember, this was in 2007, so things have happened a lot. And, that, and at, at that time, it was a, a web world. Today, it's a mobile world, so things are different. But those, we, we had this list of companies, and sometimes it was moving up and down because we also look at, okay, so that's one thing. This is the, where we have, uh, this is where you can monetize the market best. This is where we have the biggest population. And that's the, you know, that's the growth trajectory in terms of internet, the addressable inter internet market in the future. The question is also, where do you personally have traction? We suddenly have growth in a market that doesn't really have, you know, it's not really uh, monetizable. Should you leave that? And, or, or, and, and, and totally ignore that market and put all your, 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 you know, your resources into a bigger addressable market. Uh, and then it becomes more complicated. It's an online world, so it's about the network effect. Uh, it's very important if you have a hub and you have a certain activity in, in a certain area or a certain country, then the network effect is very important to continue. See, we had, you, have a, you have a growth starting there, things taking off. It's very important to continue stimulating that and help the network grow over the borders and into different markets. So sometimes those things moved up and down on the list of priority. But for us, it was typically, you know, obviously Germany was very important in Europe for us as an as online market. Uh, when we looked at Asia, uh, obviously uh, uh, Japan was very important. 
Japan, we couldn't crack ourselves by long distance. It took some time and eventually, you know, put a team in Japan and hired the first local engineers that actually started to kind of, we'll say, like popular use growth hacking, really looking at, you know, how do we, how is the Japanese user behaving online? How can we make this appeal to the Japanese, but still keeping, you know, keeping the spirit of, of, of Facebook in those days? Yeah. Um, just sort of uh, rounding up the discussion here. Um, you know, you've been to Slush a few times before. Um, what, what do you like here, especially this time around? Like, what's, what's caught your eye? What, what looks really good at the moment? Apart from the venue and <laughs> all the, all the uh, show that they've put on for Apart us. Apart from that, the fact my father lives in Helsinki, so I love Helsinki. It's great to come here. Uh, but uh, it's... it's um, what I really like here, and I use this a lot, because we have an accelerator also in Seoul, in Korea, and, and many times I get the question about, you know, you know, what's the future of Korea for entrepreneurs and so on. And many times I think about Finland, what happened here with Nokia in the beginning. It, it, you know, people started to get exposure uh, internationally, travel a lot to Silicon Valley back and forth, bringing that spirit back into yeah. to, to Finland. Uh, and eventually when kind of Nokia started to uh, uh, change or as a company, uh, all kind of startups started as uh, this ecosystem. And we see the similar thing happening, for instance, in Korea. That's very interesting, yeah. where LGs and Samsung are starting to kind of you know, shake a little bit and startups coming up and people not wanting to be a lifer for, for the big companies. So I see, obviously, Finland is, Finland is much more advanced in terms of entrepreneurial spirit and, and, and are not so risk averse. But I, I really like the quality here. Uh, we, as investors today, we focus mainly on the IoT space, uh, on fintech and on digital health and gaming. So that's perfect for us. Finland is very, we are really looking for, for, for the next, you know, interesting op opportunity here. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, Nat. I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.